today. Um, this is the third lecture uh, talking about uh, how we make shapes with metals and plastics. Um, so we've done a lot of progress in the first lecture. We were more on the theory of how the metals deform and I talked about dislocations. Last time I did hold to my promise and showed examples of what's going on with plastic. I do feel that I was going a little fast and one good thing about having a few of you in class is I can see when you get, you know, that when you're trying but you don't necessarily get the message that I'm trying to convey and that's what I use when I, for the next lecture and go back on. So for today, I'll talk a little bit more about forging. I've got some examples and then on the plastic, I essentially explain better um, and um, maybe because now we have examples, it may stimulate some more questions so you're all more than welcome just step in and say, you know, why did you bring this in class? Any, anything you want to talk about, okay? So we'll do that, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about composite, because we know this is a topic, especially for graduate students, that we're very involved with. And uh, I'm not going to tell you my conclusion right away, but uh, don't think of composite as something that's going to change everything, right? Because it's expensive, and it's also, guys can have a very brittle behavior where it's not going to bend like this, and then eventually still deform. It's still not broken. It's, it will snap on you. So I bought a bunch of those for the class. And this morning I was trying to think about why I did that. Uh, and one aspect is to show work hardening where the bend portion here becomes stronger. So if I bend it here and then I try to go the other way, it will typically bend at another location. Now the other thing here, which is important is when you deal with a, a structure, um, it's not all about material properties. So here there's a thinness effect where it starts forming a kink and that is very important, you know, that, because you can have, uh, let's say you have a piece of a tube of steel that you will make very, very thin. We can do that via processing. Then it's going to form these kinks so easily. So it's, it's uh, kind of uh, surface buckling. Uh, and therefore, if you're gonna be using tubes for structural application, a lot of times you do prefer to use aluminum. So for, for the same weight or less weight, uh, you, you have more thickness and you're more resistant to that uh, buckling. So this piece is aluminum and it's, uh, it's a low strength aluminum. That's why you can deform it quite a bit. Uh, so forging. We talked about all of these and you can see the forging one, all there is is a little square that's getting pushed. That's not very exciting, right? So it's like, and also the word forging can be associated with blacksmithing, which again looks, you know, old school, like why would we do that today? So today, examples of forging is this, these hooks, snap hooks for safety hardness. If you wanted to, machine something like this, um, be very expensive, it's a very complex shape, it has to be rounded so it doesn't get caught in a different location. Uh, if you cast it, it could be brittle, so it is forged and it's more expensive to do, but it's definitely worth the money for the safety. The bolt is an example where I said it's just easy to do, right, because you got more material here than on the shank, so uh, let's circulate that. And this is a connector where you go from a tank to a port. Because if you're going to think on a prototype about making a tank, well, most likely if you have a tank, it's because you're planning on putting something in it and putting something out of it. And that location in design is, very, is the critical place because you have stress concentration and so you may have bending load from that pipe that's coming into it. So that is a forging as well. And, and I'll show on the... Uh, on the whiteboard a little bit why you would want to use a forging here and you can know it's a forging because on the underside that oh it's been machined off um, there's the marking but a lot of times if it wasn't all machine off here you'll see a lip um, and it, just the roughness of it you know this is this is not a cast piece uh, or a machine piece so yeah so it gets at the end of it there's always some metal that's getting pushed um, okay, so why are we doing this? Let's say you have your pipe 
you go and you make an opening in it to have another pipe going out and, 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 and an inlet or an outlet, doesn't really matter. So that's here. And when you take a cross section through it, what you want to do is you have your cut in the pipe wall and you put your, your fitting on top of it. So let's say the fitting looks like this. It's got a tread here, another tread there. So what it allows you to do is you can put a weldment here. You put a weldment there and you can resist well any prying action because you create a level as opposed to trying to weld the pipe straight at that location. You have a factor of two reduction in, in the loads that are going to be applied on those welds. You're also now you know, having a contribution of the actual pipe wall here to resist those loads. So it's, it's really how it, it's, it's, it, you want to do this if it is going to be high pressure and it has to be um, uh, resistant to side loads. Um, and therefore, even if this shape is complex and it's got some treads in it, you don't want it to be a casting because ultimately, sometimes you may want to make this thinner so the weld doesn't deform. It's actually the fitting that you forge that will deform in a critical event. In critical event, it looks very, very theoretical, but this essentially is a delivery truck backing up on the, uh, you know, on the entrance port of a buried pipeline. That happens. It's a big problem if it's going to cause a leak of that pressure vessel. And, and that's why you, you need, you need uh, engineering design. You need essentially a reliable way to make these connections. And, and for a pressure vessel, the code will be prescriptive to some extent if, you, if you're making a standard design on what is possible and not possible to do. OK. Um, any questions on forging? These three pieces, you can pass them around. Um, these are examples of uh, forgings. Um, one is done for cost, the other is done for safety. Well, the two others are really for safety, reliability, uh, as opposed to using a cast or even a machine part. So, so for a part like those that are like pretty well finished and they look like Cast pieces. The best way to tell they're forged is to pull cast and see the stuff out. Uh, yes, although you could have some cast. So the question was, the way to know that the snap hooks are not cast is to do a pull test. Uh, the answer is that's one way to do it. You could have castings that in general will be ductile, but not always. They may have a porosity. So the best way to be certain if you're doing like a verification of something made overseas is you do cut it up and look at it under the microscope. That, 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 that is no doubt. Then you see how if the, if the composition is homogeneous and what the grain size is, and it's very cheap to do. It does require you to break that one part. It's cheap. It's cheap. Yeah, you can buy a few extras and, and test them. That's called quality assurance. You don't, you're not at the shop trying to do the control of quality, but you're there saying, huh, let me spot check a few here, you know, one in a hundred and see if they did what I was, they were supposed to do. Yes, it's a very, very good question. Thank you. All right, plastics. So, spherulites. That was when I started getting excited about telling you that it's the equivalent of grains for metals because we spend time with the grains. I want to make sure the plastics don't feel underestimated. So we got into the crystallite, and that's really where I saw some faces where people getting a little confused. So perhaps this schematic from a good research paper in the 80s, that tells you a little bit the time frame of knowing these things about plastics. It's more recent. It's, it's 40 years ago as opposed to 100 years ago. Uh, it's described as fair light structure. You can have um, easy shear um, at that 45 degree location. They call it the 45 degree domain. And um, I guess at the mid height of the spherulite is a place where you get more tension. So it's a little bit like a composite loaded transverse to the reinforcement and that's going to create eventually some um, propensity for making voids. So um, to make sure that you, you, you keep in mind the relevance 
of a microstructure of polymers for processing and properties. These are examples of that void formation at the mid-height of those ferrolites on a foil. So the white lines you can see on the lower right here, they kind of merge towards the center of that sphere light. So the sphere light now just looks like an hexagon, essentially. And um, you can see that those zones of white that have voids in them kind of really follow a path that is approximately perpendicular to the tension. That's this way, left to right, but not exactly, and definitely following more of a star pattern. So I guess it's a demonstration that this concept is actually relevant. Um, the stress whitening is something, if you take a clip of bread and it's color blue and you bend it and it becomes white, that's what's going on. So it's because it was made with a plastic that when you deform it, does form those voids. Uh, polycarbonate doesn't do it. Do it. It's going to stay transparent even if you deform it because it doesn't have any crystallite. So it doesn't really have sites where you can have the triaxiality tension and form voids. Uh, so going just a little deeper, that's about as far we're going to go. We talked about those macromolecules last time. And I do want you to know that the reason why a piece of plastic is going to break a lot of time is the separation of the macromolecule. You're not breaking them. Unless we're talking about epoxy. If you're talking about a polymer and you're trying to break it, these macro chain, they're going one side or the other. They're not really breaking among themselves. So knowing that, we think about flow. And of course, the longer the chain is, the harder it is to separate left and right. And therefore, your resistance to the formation of void and the growth of these voids is, is, is uh, very much affected. So in other words, you can have these craze, crazing of the polymer taking place. And it will hold for a long period of time before it breaks if the chains are long enough. Um, now, if you start cycling the load, for example, now it's very, very hard. Because even if the chains are long, they will be moving uh, more rapidly from the loading and the unloading. And therefore, those crazes will lead to fatigue fracture. And uh, to some extent, that's what I did for my master degree thesis. So any question you want to ask on that, you can come along and if I don't know, I'll tell you. Um, yes? Yes. OK, so it goes back. So it, the question was, can you explain a little bit more on the crazing? When you look at the center, so on B, you look at the mid-height, you have this dash zone. So you're thinking about this area here, where the crystals that grew from the center. So this is the center. That's the sphere light. So you have a piece of crystal here. Then you have the amorphous zone right there. Then you have another piece of crystal. And same on the other side. When you pull on this, the crystals, they just stay elastic. They only have the spring effect. Therefore, they won't shrink very much. But the spaghetti amorphous layer that's in between is just all now there the chains really start moving. And when you're thinking about that, it is a plastic behavior. So it doesn't have that same spring effect. So let's say these are only loaded elastically. They stay about where they are. They're very stiff. This is very compliant. So it's going to stretch more, which means it wants to contract. So if I take that amorphous layer, yeah, let's do this. This is useful, I think. So we take the amorphous layer, but now it's the same two plates but I only have so much of it. It's, it's just trying. It's trying to stay and connect the two, but it's being stretched so much here. This is the same amorphous layer because it has the same volume, so it's so concentrated. And here you can see because it's getting stretched this way, this way, and then and, and page of the paper. That's called stress triaxiality. And that's why you start forming these voids. Thank you. OK, so the other thing that I did is I showed you some charts that look very complex. 
Uh, but I think the part that you were knocking at is when I said, if you think about the strength to break the plastic very really quickly, uh, if it's long term, and we talk about the chair, it's going to take about you know one four percent of the load, or you come up with a number depending on which polymer it is, but a very small fraction. So I'm showing an example here that it did happen in a situation we're using tether support to uh, to hold pipe in a basin, so a big um, uh, a pond essentially for the uh, for aeration uh, of wastewater and. Um, the story there is they had a variation in the, um, the, 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 the amount of air in those pipes. So there were leaks in the systems. So there would be water coming into the pipe. Pipe starts sinking. And then uh, the, eventually the air pushes the, the water through. And now it gets reactuated. The maximum load was still the same than what they've always had on this system. But because they had a leak, didn't fix it, now all of a sudden, everything was starting to break everywhere on multiple sites, so on, on work on multiple projects that were done with the same defective joints at a certain location. And it was a really, really big problem. Because nobody wants to go in those basins and change pipes, for one thing. And um, so it's, it, at the end, it was an economic decision to use the plastic to hold. I, I didn't really explain the shape here at all. Uh, I don't know that we have the time. Maybe we do. We can do whatever we want, right? Uh, so essentially a shape that looked like a, with a base here. This is all made out of plastic. And then as some kind of a, a hook system on top. And to accept the rope, so let's say the rope comes in here. I'm going to read the rope. It gets into the top, and then it gets not here, something like that. So you, you're holding the rope with this rigid plastic thing that is cast in concrete. So talking about material selection here, um, concrete is the cheapest. So if you're going to try to get something in the bottom of the pond, and you can use concrete, let's do it. Now, making good connectors for a rope is part of concrete. That's become more of a crafting exercise. That's why you're using these stutter supports. And um, from the design, they were not going to have a whole lot of side load. But if you think of this in a simple way, when you drop that block into the pond, you don't know if it's going to settle straight. So if it turns out it's, it's going on a rock, now you've got a side load. And you have to think about that. So it's not as if all those pieces were broken over here. It was the pieces that were tilted one way or tilted the other way. And um, I, I, I don't want to digress from my main objective today, but this does bring into you know, a lot of different aspects that we are trying to teach you in the class. It's just part of reality. I mean, you have to understand the materials limitation to a steady load where it'd be fine, but because you have cyclic load and because you have a tilt, now all of a sudden the customer is not happy. And you go back to the drawing board and start thinking how I'm going to change this so it doesn't happen again. Um, and, and it would be very hard to make this system, well, with your experience that you're gaining in the class, hopefully in your engineering life, you can avoid making some of those mistakes really by thinking about the entire process. It's not just about drawing something that seems like it will fit the function of what you're looking for, is figuring out if it's going to meet all the expectations and whether you looked at everything that's going to affect that performance. So that's, that's an example of that. I have a question. How does like, the effect of like, sunlight degradation uh, like, increase crack? This one, it's key binder. Yes, so the question was what happens with the sun degradation? And the answer is it depends on the plastic. So if you have an outdoor application uh, that use polyethylene, a lot of times they'll put carbon black in it and that essentially blocks the attack. Um, now, uh, here they decide they wanted it white, so it's polyethylene or maybe it's PVC. 
and it, they put a certain amount of antioxidant in it, so it's added, and it, everything is good until you reach that maximum life. And you have to talk to the manufacturer as to how much he put in it, and there are specifications. So STM will say this one is going to resist this long in this exciting uh, temperature and environment, so you get what you paid for. Uh, be a quick answer. Yes? Tether example, was there any environmental stress tracking contributing or is there a certain plastic? Very good question. So on, on the example here, the question was if there was any environmental effect and the answer is not that I know of. Uh, it was starting at a mold line and really just looking at it as a typical tea crack. Uh, it's polyethylene, so it did start in shear deformation. It wasn't a brittle behavior. Uh, but to speak to uh, Brian's question, um, we do have examples of uh, brittle behavior that is caused from the environment. And I mentioned about that pipe, uh, but I brought it here. So let me go around and pass it because that is the exact situation that Brian was describing where uh, <clears throat> the oil acts as a lubricant to facilitate the formation of that crack or those cracks. So there are a lot of cracks in this example and um, they're all starting from the inside and they have that moon shape and that's actually something I decided to add into the class today. I did it last year and it worked well so uh, we'll see how we can do it together. We have the pipe. Um, some, it's a plastic pipe. Somehow there's been contaminant put on the inside of it. Uh, so if we look at the ID and the OD, what happens is a lot of locations had enough solvent to start making voids and initiating this slow cracking. So over time, it becomes a little bit like a teat shape, right? Because, and the reason it becomes teat is they grow until they reach the next one. Let's say they grow this way, and then because they start touching, now they go in the other direction. So they become elongated this way. When they reach each other, the only way to continue to go is to go their own way. So, and that line actually is staying merged, so sorry about that. Let's say it looks like this. So initial stage, then you have a small amount where they start realizing, oh, I have a friend. So I'm gonna make a bigger crack now because with, with the two of us, uh, it's more efficient. And then you get to this final profile that you see. You can have cases, in this case, it almost go through the entire thickness. So these tips are almost to the thickness where it started leaking without actually fracturing, but you can have both. So you can have a big rupture that causes a lot of water damage or just a small drip if it's one of those going through. Uh, because we have a lot of contaminants in the pipe, we have a lot of initiations, and we're more at risk to having a big split because all these cracks grow at the same time. If it was one imperfection, like one big particle in the polymer that caused the initiation, instead of having a lot of cracks that look alike, there'll be just one big one through the thickness and making a leak. And um, to some extent, that's what I was planning to go over next. And we do have the time, so let's do it. Crack propagation. Um, this piece is a train axle that fatigue, and it had multiple initiating cracks. You can see, and I'll point to where they were. There's one here, one there, and one there. And that's the line between them here that caused the merging. So those two cracks didn't know it about each other until they got here, and then they started to go that way. The same here is there was a crack here, then there was a crack there. Like, oh, there's only this much material left. Okay, <laughs> this, is, this is tough. Okay, so three crack location, one here, one there, and one here. What happens from that is as this crack grows and this one, eventually they'll see each other and they form a crack propagation line. So that propagation line sort of tells us that here we had two independent cracks that came together, but they were not doing exactly the same trajectory and they form a step. 
Uh, the other side here started here, and, and the reason I say that is all these, these beach marks that shows the history, just like lines on, on a tree when you cut a tree of where the crack was over time. So, so those are the two kinds of line that we use for determining the origin of a crack. So we have the crack arrest line or the beach marks, and then we have the crack propagation line that separate two regions. So this case, there was something wrong, and you can probably see it. The spitting, there's a little bit of wear. So the biggest area of wear, there was probably a problem with the bearing here, that initiated just a few cracks. And those cracks grew, it took a long time to grow. Yes, a ratchet mark. You can play with it. That's a benefit of being in class, in addition to giving me some feedback. Okay, so another example of making this process of uh, looking at the fracture surface more than an academic exercise is, uh, is, is an engine that uh, had a valve that broke, so the, the valve head got stuck into the engine, everything went bad, and they were offshore, and nobody was happy. So get the parts from the mail. It's not delivered on a red carpet. Uh, but they still want to know what's going on. So all you know at that point, got broken valve. It's very dirty, and it has a fracture surface. So looking at the end of it, it's pretty flat. It's, it doesn't have the characteristic of a tensile specimen like this one that would form a neck, so reduce the section and, and break. So you start. That's that's where you start thinking about environment, you start thinking maybe brittleness, you start thinking maybe fatigue or something that just happens slowly over time as opposed to a straight overload. So this was not an overload. This happened over time. So the question always is, clean it up, look, start looking at it. You wanna know what happened, like what, what made the crack start and grow. The best way to do this is start figuring out where the crack started. In this case, we do have two sites. So on the image, the final fracture is on top, because it's in, and you see a straight line across, that's the final crack RS line. So there's very little metal left. It was cracked all the way from here to here until it finally broke. Um, and I think we can all see this crack RS line here. We can see a small crack RS line there, and it's kind of shining from there. These are crack propagation lines. So we have an idea it either started here, here, probably at the same time. So we're already getting educated here. Uh, and it looks like bending because it starts on one side and it goes to the other. So very basics, but now just uh, and this site can't really tell anything, not very useful here. So. This is all things that once you have some experience, you can do very quickly, or you hire a consultant to do it very quickly for you. And uh, what you find is a bunch of initiation sites. So over here, I got about 10 places where the crack started, a little bit like I had on that pipe. How'd that happen? Well, this is here, this, this uh, area that is not in focus is a corrosion pit. So, if I see the crack all initiating at the same time at the bottom of a corrosion pit, I think it's fair to say that I had corrosion when the engine wasn't being used, and as soon as I started, and then all of a sudden I got all these little fatigue cracks, and then it took a while to grow and cause the failure. So that's why you get paid. You can get paid, you know, I don't know, two, three thousand dollars for spending a couple hours looking at this and talking to the guys. And the biggest piece there is always to try to explain it. Because you're not the one deciding who's gonna pay for what, but they have to understand what happened in a way that is understandable. And that's why if you want to do that work, I'm happy to train you because I don't have the time to explain to a boat owner much these days what happened. It's just... So would the advice be to more regularly start the engine? Yeah, exactly. So as far as a proactive measure here with a combustion engine is uh, if you haven't used it for a couple of years, it could be that you ran out of lubricant. 
could also be that if you did have some water exposure and you didn't use it right after that, now your risk of having this effect is very large. And to some extent, it's, it's a lack of maintenance if that is what happened. But then you're starting to make a judgment call as to whether the boat owner did the oil change or not. And it's not engineering at that point. It's just, you know, and you have to decide. Uh, based on the information you have. But, so, very simple. Again, it's only based on knowing two types of line and going through the effort of cleaning it. And what is interesting with failure analysis is once you know the answer, of course it's obvious, right? Like, you could go back to what it looked like here. You can see the corrosion pit. But, you know, I, I have experience, and when I saw this, you can't be biased you, because it's not conclusive. It's not conclusive until you do all the work. And, and, you know, I'd say it's incomplete if you just say, well, you know, these valves are corroded. They really shouldn't be corroded. I mean, the engine stays out of service a while after also, so how do you know that corrosion didn't happen after the rupture? And that's really where the, you know, you have to actually look and observe what the data tells you. So I thought I'd bring it in. It's really, we do a lot. This coming spring, I will do a six hour on, on, uh, on fracture surfaces, I think, because it always captures a lot of attention. And there's so many ways that you can, uh, you can make use of that in, in a practical sense. If nothing else, to impress your grandmother, maybe, or somebody that you understand why that toy broke, it had a, you know, a bad bond line or it had a notch in it. It's so easy, I mean, it's just a lot. Uh, let's skip this. Okay, so we really, so our, our goal for the, uh, the last little bit is to um, tie in here on the plastic so we can move on for the next lecture. We're gonna cover other interesting stuff. Uh, I think we're gonna move to corrosion. Uh, I'm making this module six hours now, so I'm moving things a little bit around. Um, typically, after talking about deformation, we'll talk about heat treatment of metal, but in reality, heat treatment and welding really go well together. So instead of doing uh, the original plan with, from the 12-hour module, is we'll put the heat treatment with something else, and here we're going to move on. and continue to talk about how to make the material really accept the details of the heat treatment. So making plastic bottles, it's a big industry and it's cheap. So you start from your feedstock and you can see it here, it gets into this opening and you have your nozzle, you blow some air and it goes against the mold. And there you go, you have a plastic bottle. Um, keep making them thinner uh, because of cost and there is, of course, uh, some concerns about solubility of what is in the polyethylene getting into the water, uh, but I'm not a, a health, uh, water health expert uh, at this point, so um, I'll defer on that. All I say is um, it's always good to know a little bit how it's being done. Um, Resin transfer molding <coughs> was a really big buzzword when I was a student your age. Uh, it still is something people talk about or not anymore. <coughs> it's mixed. Well, if it's talked about, um, it's in research because <laughs> it's not used a whole lot. And the reason is there's just a whole lot of money involved in making a mold, finding a way <coughs> to organize your reinforcement and then injecting the resin into it. So you, the, the, this schematic, I'm using it for two purposes, but <clears throat> the purpose of the resin transfer is literally you lay out all your reinforcement and somehow you find a way to get that viscous plastic to feed into it. You can make very precision parts, but now you have molds, you have process temperature, the environment, so this, this polymer doesn't oxidize. It's very, very expensive. So. <clears throat> And that's the takeaway that I, uh, I'd like you guys to go out of the class on that is um, you can use composites. You know, it's really cool for the tail of the aircraft. 
and things like that that you know you don't expect to be loaded to a point of failure um, and have to permanently deform uh, significantly. But uh, as far as practical applications where there's a huge of a large volume of plastic, uh, to my knowledge, it's few. Uh, so what I'm showing here is uh, <clears throat> high pressure composite pipe that are very similar to when we talked about the, uh, the pre-stressed concrete cylinder. So you have the inner plastic core, and then when you come with your enforcement, if it's glass or carbon fiber, and you wrap it around, so you're able to compress that core. And you can see those wraps here. That's the reinforcement. It's compressing the plastic on the inside, and then you coat that. So it's an effective way of applying the reinforcement, you're really just winding it on your part or you turn your pipe to, to make this happen. There is still cost involved with the resin and, and the process. Uh, so it's still not very um, cheap. And you need to worry about how you put pieces together. You can't weld two of these pieces together. So you either have to make very sophisticated flanges or you make uh, bell and spigot, so two pieces that come together with an O-ring, and um, I talked about that more in the application section, but <clears throat> I thought I'd bring it in really in the context of um, making parts from essentially polymers. You can use any polymer you like here, uh, but the, the, your cost keeps going up if you want something that uh, it's good for creep resistance and it's also good for chemicals. So those are used uh, for chemical applications, also used for uh, emergency water um, because you can have high pressure and you're not using those all the time. So the, the, the wear and all these aspects are not that terrible. Another example, and that's something that I bring up multiple times. That's what you'll see if you watch a lot of uh, my modules. The, the best example, I bring them up more than once, but it's just because they, are, they help reinforce more than one concept. So I just said that composite were expensive, but <clears throat> they are used for making underground storage tank for gasoline at stations. Um, so we got about 40,000 gallon capacity here, it's going to be in the ground 25, 40 years. Um, the, the, there's a cost up front for digging the site, getting everything out of the way, shutting down the, uh, the, the station. Uh, there's a cost associated with putting the pipes in, and then there is a cost associated with a, the periodic inspection of what's going on. That's why you see the hole on top, is, is, it's an access. Those, uh, those pipes will be double wall. So the way they do the double wall here is we're looking at the rim here. So on the outside, these rims for reinforcement, you see it here. And then you see one pipe wall and you have a little opening and then another pipe wall. So what they do is the, the liquids here and if it infiltrates through the first layer, it's going to actuate a sensor at the bottom of the tank that you've now lost your primary containment and therefore you have to take actions. Um, so it's, it's, people are taking it very seriously not to release uh, uh, oil and gas into the, uh, the ground near the gas station, which is really important. Now, why you think, um, why you think they're okay with doing something that looks so complex uh, as opposed to taking a piece of steel. Okay, yes, so the story is you make a mold, so you've got your two halves of a pipe. This is big, so you can have a guy coming in there or, or, or a robot and you can spray uh, the plastic with some small chips of glass reinforcement. So chopped glass reinforced plastic is the type of composite here. And therefore you build up that thickness and you can see that the thickness 
of that oriented zone is a little less, so they had to come with the gun at an angle to get the plastic in there. Then what they did is they passed a mat at some point and said, I'm not going to feel that reinforcement anymore, so they start spraying into that, that mat to get it straight. Eventually, they apply the, the membrane layer and just build it up from the outside in, then take the mold off. You got a pipe. You got, a, you got an entire cylinder, and it is a single piece. Uh, no joints. So that's, that's actually a very, very big advantage as opposed to taking a piece of steel pipe and then having to put welds everywhere to make it round all around and putting the caps on it. You know, if you think about steel here, are you really going to do this dome shape like you do an airplane? It's expensive, so you, you want to think about it. So in this case, it's all done at once using relatively inexpensive resin and reinforcement. Yes? Can you just spray the resin on the, on the mold? Yes. So the question is, do you really spray it? Yes. So you'll start, the, so the gun is going to heat up the resin to a point where it's, it's fluid and it's, it's like spray paint. Then when you have enough put on to make that nice look surface, you start feeding also the, the glass chopped particle into that resin and it sprays both at the same time. Yes, absolutely. Um, so why both of them are used today? It's a very big question. It depends on the use case. That's a very good uh, general question. It's a good way not to get in trouble. Uh, in this case, more specifically, so it's, let's say when you put a dollar sign here on this, and then you have, that's, the, that's how you're going to make your decision. And then you have steel or plastic. Um, what are the main parameters for a, you know, a gas station owner? Um, you do have to buy the tank. Then you're going to... Um, have it install and maintain. Um, I have to say overall, for this particular case, it turns out to be about the same. Um, what some of the differences is about the use case that was brought up is installing a plastic pipe you do need a good contractor <laughs> that knows how to put the gravel. So what happens is it's soft, right? It's made out of resin, so it's, and therefore you're relying on the ground and, and how you put your aggregate on the lower half of the pipe so it doesn't sag too much. If the contractor that you're using has never done it, of course you'll see Put in a, a steel, put in a steel, you know, tank because you know how to do that. Um, you know how to do that, and in that case, the downside is you have to put catalytic protection. So you need to have a way to make sure that the, there's no tick, thickness loss once you lost the uh, the paint layer. Um, so this is more <laughs> a personal preference. If you have a contractor that likes to do things a certain way, uh, and that's, you have to either agree with him or you change the contractor. Is, is it the two options that I see the, the best. Just because there is a, a know-how associated with both techniques. And you can go into the details. Well, maintenance in one case, well, if it's a, if it really being installed as a, Impress current, there's really little to do with the anode also for 25, 30 years, there's not a whole lot to do. So I, as an owner of a, of, of a gas station, I think installing it and buying the tank do end up being major factors. You have to comply with regulation. There are requirements for both cases and what you need to do. Um, and. Um, the, the, yeah, the, the, um, it's, it's just a trade-off. There's no perfect scenario. 
there was a big project that I was involved with where extra solvents or contaminants in the gasoline were really making a big attack to the composite in a way that just wasn't known. And therefore, they did have to replace a series of tanks that were affected by that supply of gasoline. And of course, if you're talking about the technology of steel tank that's been used 50 years, then you don't have that problem. So to some extent, for somebody to say, I w when they started 30 years ago, you had to be an early adopter to go with the plastic, and maybe you had to have a little bit of a cost incentive, uh, given how proven the alternative was. And maybe on that, I'll even add that if you have a steel tank, you can repair it locally. That's, that can be done. But the composite, if it starts sagging and deforming, it's over. You got to put an entire new one. Let's skip that one. It's to be too long. So we covered a lot of topics, uh, but I, I'm feeling good because I think now that you can see we can take material and put them into shapes in a really great variety of ways. Um, and the blacksmithing is still an option, even if it, was, it looks like it's old school, because in some cases, it will give you the best properties. Um, plastic science is something that, from my standpoint, a lot of people talk about polymer, a lot of people you know, in the nano lab here, we pull on individual molecules and things like that, cells and that. But as far as plastic engineering, there's a lot of that's been discovered and applied over the past 50 years. And I'm just really giving you a brief overview of some of the things to think about, including that most of those polymers that are opaque are semi-crystalline. And that has a lot of implication in how you process them and how you can get some properties out of them. Um, the fracture surfaces, really, that was kind of an add-on, but I thought it fit in uh, because we've been talking a lot about mechanical properties to some extent. Um, so you have the crack propagation lines. That's the same as um, the ridge between two rivers. You know, you got, you got flow one side, you got, go, you got a crack moving, and then they form a step between them. The ones that are more intuitive are those beach marks or the, the crack arrest line um, that tells you the profile of the crack at a point in time. And we had one example of that, and it's a, it's a topic for another series of lecture. And for composites, they have very specific use in certain applications, including applications where they're using tremendous volume. And then a special application where it really is a one of a kind. Uh, the Army right now in additive manufacturing, they'll make composite via additive manufacturing really one part of the time. So, so it speaks to kind of the cost associated with that. But one idea is instead of trying to have an inventory of repair parts for, for, for old system that you're trying to extend the life, they, they'll say, well, these are acceptable replacement when a helicopter comes in, I can say I, this part needs to be replaced and the next day it's available, which otherwise you need another helicopter to bring that part from a place that would apparently stock it, but it's not economically feasible to stock these things and, and move over so quickly over big distances. So, Maybe that brings in a topic when you're relying here on maintaining an inspection, you're dependent on the next owner for a structure. And that is by itself a big challenge. So we, the next lecture, we're gonna switch over and I think the composite steel tank's gonna help us here keep, keep, keep our momentum going. Uh, we'll talk about corrosion and corrosion control and uh, the ways that you deal with that with stainless steel, copper, aluminum, and um, whatever else you want to talk about in terms of corrosion. Uh, it's something that a lot of students end up having questions or realize that it's, it's not that complicated. It's, it is always a battery effect. You always have an anode and a cathode, even if it's a piece of steel that's rusting outside. Um, 
because it rains. So start thinking about that. Thank you.